beloved I am presence we are reminded tonight of Gideon and the sword of the Lord we are reminded tonight of the need for vigilance that we are not taken aware by the destruction at noontide or the energies of darkness at midnight. We ask therefore that thy shield and thy buckler will sustain us always and that we may run the race with caution and at the same time with fearlessness that we may be directed from on high to stimulate the Christ flame within our heart and to refuse acceptance of mortal imperfection. We thank thee and accept it done right now in mercy's name. Amen. Please be seated. We will sing number 35, which is the Londonderry Air, a song of spring. The last time we sang it, we had snow, I think, the next day. I hope we don't this time. is one that we must ponder because we are certain 
that immortality itself would be extremely boring and unhappy if it were to be in many of the human states presently existing in the world. We feel that God has prepared better things for us, that the kingdom of heaven is a place of greater joy than any we know here below, that the joys that we contemplate below, like the sorrows that we have here upon this earth, actually would not be the substance that we would desire to have eternity composed of. Because mortal joys and mortal sorrows are both alike, they are the opposite poles of the same axis. The human that is exalted may be the human that is debased. The human that is despised may be the human that is eulogized. The human that is rich may be the human that is poor, that is well, that is sick, and so on ad infinitum. But in the kingdom where the perfection of God is and exists, God wipes away all tears from such eyes and there is no sorrow, no regrets, no pain, no suffering because all is the manifestation of creative love. At times one wonders if the contrast media, the conditions of earth now manifesting, are meant in themselves to propel us toward heaven. One asks oneself the question, is the darkness here intended to be so thick that it can be felt so that man will reach up toward the light and desire to push through the density and the darkness of the world? To most of the people in the world, the things that are illusory are the things of the spirit. What they cannot see, taste, touch, feel, or handle, they do not believe exists. It must be understood then that this world of illusion that most people think is not real is the world of the spirit that we consider to be more real than the world around us. I think, however, that there is a grave danger in man's concepts of what is illusion and what is reality. For example, the patterns of flowers, trees, and natural manifestations are often patterns that can endure, as above, so below. We find nothing in our consciousness that forbids us to believe in eternal flowers, flowers that never fade, or the perpetuation of these patterns in higher octaves. So we begin to ask ourselves, what is real and what is unreal? That which is unreal is human suffering, human violence, human sense of struggle, human concepts of self and fear, doubt. All of these conditions are unreal. It is not real to have doubt. Because perfect faith eradicates doubt from the consciousness. And perfect faith is real. Well, if perfect faith is real, doubt cannot be real. Nor can fear be real if perfect love casts it out. So we must be perfected in love. We must accept the consciousness of God that is from above, but that is also 
one who may enter within. Do you understand? In other words, he is the unseen guest that may enter within and convey from above those realities that are a part of heaven. Well, when they are within us and the kingdom of heaven should be within us, then it does not seem to be far from us. But when the illusions of the world enclose round about us, they are like dark clouds or a fog at sea. They shroud everything in their misty atmospherics. And we wind up saying to ourselves, well, just what is really out there? We hear a sound through the fog, a bell tolling. Perhaps it's a boy. It may be a church bell. It may be near shore. It may be the cook beating on a skillet from another ship that's passing by. We don't know what it is. We think we do. We try to identify what we see through the fog of illusion. But even if we succeed or think we do in identifying it, have we really penetrated it? Only when it clears in its own natural way, when the light actually bursts forth and the clouds lift and we can see clearly, do we realize whether we are at sea or close to land or just where we are? And so the power of God to dispel illusion, the power of reality to be its own eraser or artist, to create its own artistry, this is all inherent within the divine nature. God can erase or wipe away tears from eyes. He can assuage grief. He can change vibrations and emotions. Or God can create by his artistry, the artistry that we see in the frost and the snowflake and in the flower and in the waterfall, the babbling brook, the fleecy cloud curtains that pass across the sky. In all these things, as well as even in our minds, God can create his artistry. And when he does, we know the difference. We know the difference between the vibrations of heaven and the vibrations of earth. And we welcome the vibrations of heaven. The vibrations of earth are often very disturbing to us because, first of all, so many of them are painful in our current times. They are painful because of the accumulation of negative forces in the consciousness of humanity. There is a tremendous accumulation or accretion of unhappiness in human consciousness. This is easily lifted in the human by creature comforts, food, a warm bed, friends, a change of scenery, a pleasant drive. Any little thing can temporarily uh, make people that are unhappy happy. So doctors say take a trip and people are sick. Take a trip, go somewhere because you'll change your whole thought. You'll feel better. Sometimes they do. But even this is only temporary because as soon as we again reestablish the causes of inharmony in our world, right back where we started from, we are, as the German might say. So, what do we do then to affect a more permanent change? Well, first of all, we have to understand what is lost. You cannot lose God. In other words, God cannot be lost himself. Truth is not lost. Nor are we actually as people lost. What we have lost is the consciousness of reality. 
We ourselves are not lost. The consciousness of reality is lost temporarily from us. And temporarily can mean a million years or a day or an hour. But when we've lost contact, the anguish can be as gross as painful as when Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because we have lost a glimpse of reality. Those who find reality, even in a lesser way, those who find a portion, a little spark of God, that little spark is just as precious to them as the altar fires in the temple are to the high priest. And if we are accustomed to that little spark of contact with God, and then it becomes eclipsed, even for a moment, we miss it. And we must remember that our treasures that are in our heart are uniquely our own. The treasures that we have, the contacts we have with God, are the only possible mirror that will reflect for us eternal reality. So it is the consciousness that we must nourish, the consciousness that we must protect, the consciousness that we must guard. All of this is a very important part of ourselves. It is the most important part of ourselves. Because this is the part that knows that I am I. The dog can smell the food, can be conditioned, as Pavlov found out, to responses, to respond when a bell rings, to salivate, to be hungry, to have many emotions, emotions of praise and blame. The dog knows when he's scolded, but he doesn't know that he is. He is so involved in his consciousness, the consciousness that he has, the group consciousness, that he is really not aware of himself. He's aware of the externals, all the things that happen around him. And some people are almost like that. They get so involved in externals that they do not have any awareness. But you see, awareness was given to us in order to find God. If we had no awareness, we could not be aware of God any more than we could be aware of self. And so awareness and consciousness are extremely important gifts from God. The masters, they desire to nourish our consciousness, to improve our sense of awareness. Because they know that awareness that we have of the agonies of the world are very dire. and they will not produce happiness. So the masters work and strive to create a higher sense of awareness in us so that we can appreciate the world to come. And the world to come need not be a remote world. We can say, well, it's like something in the dinosaur age. The world to come can be here. We can have a sense of the eternal and the infinite right while we're here. We can nourish that spark that God has put within us. We can expand it. And gradually, our awareness will increase to where the thread of human contact is less and less important. And the divine is all important. But I wish to stress here as a note of warning that the divine and infinite contact does not make man to be less loving, less understanding, less involved in the universe, but with greater understanding, greater love, and more sense of involvement in the universe. If man's search for God is to find escape from trouble, and from the world, and from the things that might pain him, from fear of involvement. This is not God, it is escapism. 
It's a retreat of the consciousness into a shell of itself, like the turtle pulling back his neck. Life is meant to be lived to the fullest extent, but it's meant to be lived in the infinite, and the finite is its doorway. The world in which we live is the doorway. And the harder we tug upon that door of life here, the greater opportunity we can have of walking through and stepping into the infinite. But this is an extension, you see, this stepping through into the infinite. It is an extension of our life. And that is why Jesus said, I am come that ye might have abundant life. I am come that ye might have life, and that more abundantly, because he wanted us to step through the veil into that more abundant life. People talk about feeling better, about having more knowledge, about being more important. Feeling better? This means a balance of body, soul, and mind in harmony. It has to be. And we have to reach out into the infinite world. For the infinite world can only be found through our present embodiment and its continuation. If we cut ourselves off from reality and live our life out without nourishing the spark that is within, when we come before the great lords of karma and they say to us, what have you done with your talents we gave you? We have no answer, we're speechless. Why, I've lived them all for myself. He who seeks to save his life will lose it. But he who loses his life for my sake, he will find it again. This didn't mean crucifixion in the ordinary sense. Losing it, as the masters have said, means to loose it, to let go of it. Not try to feel that we own our own lives. St. Paul said, you are bought with a price. Your life is not your own, he said. And so, to understand that our life is God's, that it belongs to him, causes us to desire to identify with he who is the master planner. The master planner who has the perfect plan. And people are afraid to submit or to surrender their life to him. As a child, did we object to running to the arms of our mother or our father if we loved him? And as we grew older and had less fear of our father, we probably ran as willingly to him as we would to our mother. For there is something to familiarity. Familiarity can breed contempt or familiarity can breed real love. And this is what it ought to breed. This is what it ought to develop, is real love. As we come to know God more, we should love him more. I know of nothing greater in the world than God's love, nor nothing more elusive to man when all of the scintillating baubles and trinkets and all of the ash of the world's wails and laments is directed at us. There is no doubt in my mind that the forces that would nourish darkness have no love for the children of the light. And I have for many years now known that there are children of the light and also that there are children of darkness. Jesus knew it and he said, Ye are of your father the devil, for he was a liar from the beginning and a murderer. We cannot then find that our happiness will always be in all flesh, for flesh is as grass. Our happiness must be in our creator, who has provided wonders that are undreamed of for us in his kingdom. We are all in a common lot. We are cast in a common lot. We really are. 
our life experiences are quite alike in many ways. We have our dislikes and our likes, our fears and our hates, our loves, and our uncertainties, our doubts, our confusions, our tests, and all. We have it all. But when we must, We wish tonight to deal with the subject of can the soul be lost. Tonight, in probably thousands and thousands of Orthodox churches, the teachings are basically on the good life, which is their version of the kingdom of God. In thousands of other churches, there are fundamental concepts of men being lost and saved. We therefore will concern ourselves tonight with can the soul be lost? And we prefer to plunge directly into answers on the question. And the answer is yes, the soul can be lost. But not the way most people think it can be lost. And so first of all, we return to the idea of re-embodiment. Does the soul re-embody? The answer is also yes. What is the proper word to use to express re-embodiment to other people who inquire? Re-embodiment is the proper expression and the Lord God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul. So for practical purposes, we consider that the soul becomes a fusion of the body and the spirit or breath of life, the pneuma. It is similar to fire. Fire requires a combustible element, does it not? and oxygen. You have to have something to burn to create fire, don't you? You don't have fire without something is burning. And if you don't have oxygen, you do not have a fire either. And so the fire of the soul is the result of the fusion of the body and the spirit or breath of life. What we are talking about then when we say the soul can be lost is not really that at all. We're talking about the consciousness of the soul as an individual monad. A man could supposedly have immortality and never be conscious at all. In other words, whether or not a person is in a body which is required in order to have this oxygen, you see, oxygen and combustion, in order to have the combustibility of consciousness, we have to have the fusion of the body, and if it is not this vehicle that is, then it must be another vehicle that shall be. But you have to have some kind of a vehicle, because the naked spirit of God possesses all the power and glory of God and the consciousness of God, but does not individualize until it actually enters into the monadic manifestation. We must understand that this is what we're talking about when we say it can be lost. It is the Christmas tree bulb in the continuous chain. The Christmas tree bulb that is in a series circuit where it must feed through from the generator or the power source and go out on the wire in a circuit or circle. Each light bulb in this circuit is dependent on the flow of current through all of the other light bulbs in the chain. And if one goes out, they all go out. And so in the divine sense, you see, there is always the complete circuit of the power of God flowing through all souls. But this does not mean individual consciousness. 
Individual consciousness comes in at birth and is momentarily suspended at death. However, it can reestablish itself in another vehicle after death. And so it can be rightly said that the soul sleepeth. As Jesus said about Lazarus, he said, he sleepeth and I go to awake him out of his sleep. And they said, well, Lazarus is dead. But in reality, the consciousness was sleeping. We do this every day. We go to bed every night, we go to sleep. But we're not dead. To die, to lose the soul completely, to be a cast away from God is another process. And I want to explain what is meant by the loss of the soul. You don't lose it through death any more than you do through sleep. There is a way you lose it. Man is given monadic expression in order to attain complete and absolute identification with God. The whole purpose of life is so that the man can consciously attain what he already had subconsciously. Man had the image of God stamped within him. The image of God that is stamped within him was functional in the universe so that God sighs in the trees, blows in the wind, flows in the stream, comes down to us as heat through the light of the sun. God in nature, whether he's conscious individually or not, exists. He is. He's vital, he's living. But here we're dealing with vast and sweeping powers in the individual. The consciousness of the Godhead manifests. Only man can actually manifest God. Made a little lower than the angels, yet crowned with more glory than they. To be a man is a great privilege because a man, a living soul, can become a living God. And there is no desecration at all, but only the fulfillment of purpose. And so the great pattern that magnetizes people all over the world and causes them to be coupon clippers and send in letters to organizations that tell them they might be able to master their life or find themselves is all based on the fact that there is a hidden hunger that gnaws at the human heart and soul and makes every man desire and remember subconsciously his divine ideation, his divine level. He can soar through the air with the greatest of ease, this daring young man on the flying trapeze. Because he knows he is not tied to the body within, he knows that he has the power to just sweep through the trees at any speed he wants to in consciousness. He knows he can rocket to the farthest stars anywhere in the universe and return almost with a speed far greater than light back to his present state. He knows that he has indomitable energy, tireless energy from God. He has a memory of perfection and harmony and happiness and he hears the sound of the Om, the sound of the Om in the universe. He hears that in his consciousness. Man has all of that. Man is a manifestation of God. But as we started out earlier in our first little talk, it's that spark that is the sun in miniature. It's the microcosm within man. It's the macrocosm as God, the greater and the lesser. Unfortunately, people can lose their soul. And how is this possible with re-embodiment? We could understand it the old way, you say, with orthodoxy. That people were born and they were not good. And so God punished them. And they lost their soul. And the loss of the soul meant they would go to hell and burn forever and ever. Well, that's not loss of soul. If you burn forever and ever, if you're miserable and tormented forever, you're not losing anything. You still have consciousness. But you exist. But Jesus spoke of losing your soul. And this is where they don't understand it at all. The loss of the soul refers to something else. 
It refers to the spark individualized, the part or portion of God that we received as the prodigal son. It's our inheritance that we lose, our immortal inheritance of becoming God. We are so busy becoming ourselves, this ego that is I, that we fail to become this God that I already am. And the ego is the source of all man's complaints and troubles. And God is the source of all man's deliverance and freedom. Well, why is it then that all people listen with eager ears to these preachers that come out and say, come to Jesus and be saved tonight? It's because of that awful hunger in the heart to really find God and to save that which could be lost. The divine image itself was not actually lost to man. He simply lost the consciousness of the divine image. It is still within his power and always has been from the foundation of the world for man to be what God intended him to be. And nowhere do we find a greater proof of this than in that massive and magnificent being, Enoch, the seventh from Adam. There was a man born before Christ, born shortly after Adam, as we read, who walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Did God absorb him? Did he inhale him? What happened to him? We heard from him at the last class. Behold, I am alive forevermore. He had the I am consciousness of the I am alive forevermore. Behold, I am alive forevermore. Centuries and millenniums have passed, and Enoch is still alive because he has immortal life. He is not lost. He didn't lose the divine image. He regained it before Christ, you say. Well, you see, Christ said, before Abraham was, I am. So it is the I am consciousness. The consciousness of the being of God, which is attained through the Christ consciousness, or the light, that gave Enoch his power. And that's the same thing that gives us all our power. We all come back to the mediatorship of our own holy Christ self, the eternal flame of the living Christ that is within us, the fourth man in the fiery furnace of trial, one like unto the Son of God. And how wonderful this is. Once we understand it, and we have only begun now to understand it because there is a great deal more here than first meets the eye. For example, the little spark that I'm talking about is the spark of God's identity. And we have thought that it was the spark of our own identity. It only becomes our own identity when we make it our inheritance. It must be ratified. We must claim it. And so we can lose it through ignorance. We can ignore it. We can refuse to exercise the mandates and prerogatives of immortal life. We can coast along like a greased pig in life and fly through the air and land on the earth and slide, slide anywhere, maybe into somebody's frying pan. It's true. A homely illustration, but true nonetheless. Or we can be a guided missile, guided by faith, guided by hope, guided by charity, guided by divine wisdom, guided by the masters, the angels, and those who have the knowledge of what to do. And then our life is no longer chaos. Our life is point to point. Otherwise, if it isn't point to point, instead of being a straight line, our life is jagged. And a jagged life is a cut up life. And a cut up person feels unwholesome. They're not integrated. Integration is important, the integration with God. We're all seeking that. But what is it that is lost? It's opportunity. It's the spark. 
and it's more. Something can be lost. And what is it that can be lost? And how can it be lost? I think perhaps we can identify it more if we tell you how it can be lost. All right? You have identity. You say, I am I. You know you're yourself. But this I am I guy that says I am I, he can be many things. Can he? He can be a saint. He can be a sinner. He can be happy. He can be unhappy. He can be whole. He can be sick. He can be rich. He can be poor. He's the vacillator. He fluctuates back and forth. Again and again. All right? What is it that's lost? Well, it's this way. We get an embodiment. We have it, and we live it, and we live entirely for the self. I call it the not-self. We live for the human self, which is really the not-self. And the real self, that is God, we don't live for. We don't know him. We're interested in externals. We live in externals, and internals are ignored. All right? Now we have this spark. Any man that knows anything about atomic energy knows that substance can have an atomic decay rate, which means that you can wear away stone. You can wear away substance. You can put atomic energy into substance, and it will gradually begin to ebb out. When people talk about something ebbing out in a million years, they say to themselves, well, that's so long, it's so, so vast, so big, that for all practical purposes, I'll live forever. They say that until the last day of the million years, when the decay rate is finally ran out. And when it runs out, honey child, there ain't any more. It's gone. Because the mystery of all this is in the concept of the god Vulcan. We have a system here of patching tires. Master explained it once. Think about the dictations. When you put a patch at a tire, you bring enough heat to bear on that patch and it welds right into the original atoms. You can't even tell sometimes if you do it right where the patch is. We call that vulcanizing. Well, you see, God is a consuming fire. Did you ever read that? It's in Hebrews. It says, our God is a consuming fire. Now, the soul of man is actually the soul consciousness and everything. This is all that spark. Khalil Gibran says it is a flame spirit gathering more of itself. The whole purpose of life, then, is to increase this contact, to build up the levels of energy. This is the difference between the vitality of some people and the vitality of others, spiritual vitality there. Heliobus, in Marie Crowley's novel, who was a, an actual picturization of St. Germain, he talked about the electric circle, and he talked about man developing within himself the electric spark. He talked about the electric creed of Christianity. He talked about the power of the Christ that caused him to say, after his resurrection, when it was surging through him, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended unto my Father. To have touched him at that moment, she says in this book, would have meant instant death to the people who would have touched him. And so, how can the soul be lost? Things are not static. That's how it can be lost. They don't stand still. They either go up or they go down. And if your momentum, the momentum of the soul, finally loses its power on its trajectory, it's flying through the air with the greatest of ease, and suddenly it loses power. What happens to this missile? When it doesn't have enough power to, to maintain its 18,000 miles per hour orbit around the Earth, it drops into the Earth, doesn't it? Where it burns up unless it's properly protected as these missiles are. An ordinary meteor would burn up when it loses trajectory and slows down. So man is not static. He's either moving forward or he's slowing down. So what actually happens then when you lose your soul is that you lose your momentum. You are given an initial pulsation. 
You were a real pulsar. You were given an initial God pulsation to emit light. And you were sent out with this gift of light. And you were expected, as Khalil Gibra said, to be a flame spirit gathering more of itself. You were supposed not to manufacture God, this you couldn't do, but to draw the energies of God, as Jesus put it, he took the talents and invested them and made other talents with it. We were expected to build upon the foundation of the New Jerusalem and put all the, the 12 thrones, these jewels you talk about that compose the temple. All of these jewels are symbolical but also factual manifestations of the energies of God that are available to man in the Godhead, whereby he himself can become a holy city. Know ye not that your bodies are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. This means that man is supposed to be able to will himself by attunement with God's will to a place where he can draw the proper foundation stones of the new Jerusalem in himself, where he can be then given a white stone in which is a new name written that no man knows save he himself. And that is his own unique vibration. The vibration he gets from interpolating the energies of God and drawing the life plan of his own native God identity from the Godhead. Not one person in the universe is key to light, nor will they ever be key to light. We see it in the snowflake and the mysteries of it. The complete individual ideational God pattern for every individual is different, but it is basically the same in its foundation stone. And that's why you have your 12 stones in the New Jerusalem that are the foundation. All of us will have a basic similarity, and we come to a point where we no longer converge, but we diverge. And that is the individual of claiming and claiming his God identity. So what is it we can lose? We can lose that opportunity. Because in all of the many embodiments we have had, we have come eating and drinking. We have come marrying and giving marriage. And we have all passed through the deluge of the flood where the individual is wiped away as though he never were at all. And the mysteries of sleep come over him, and he awakes, as Khalil Gibra again says, a little while, a moment of rest upon the waves, and another woman shall bear me. And so the great mystery of life is now to be found in the fact that man returns. But, as was once said, if Christ be born a thousand times in Bethlehem, if he be not born in thee, then he has lived in vain. And so, though we be born a million times by a million women, and we can call a million different women mother, if we don't fulfill the opportunity of life that God intends us to fulfill, then we are castaways and we lose our soul because the soul, unnourished, unfed, and unattended to, gradually gradually loses its initial impulse from God. And the candle flame consumes the wax of the identity and literally burns out the energies of the soul. And if you light it at both ends, it burns faster. And if you light it in the middle, it consumes itself more quickly. And so the soul can be consumed just simply in the business of living, where a life goes by in which we coast on the momentum that God put in the initial pulsation of being without ever claiming anything that is progressive and accelerative. Do you understand? For man is as grass. My spirit shall not always strive with man, for he is as grass, and his days are as the flower of the field that passeth away. And the fashion thereof changeth. And this is what is meant. God gave man the gift of life and infinite mercy. And so, what is the losing of the soul? I shall tell you. 
The losing of the soul is the second death. The first death that comes often to men is the death of the body. But the second death is the death of the soul, the loss of the soul. Not hellfire, but never shalt thou be anymore. And the way it would be done by hellfire is this. If man were to not fulfill his destiny, if man were to say, I'll live just for myself and I'll do as I please, if he said this, and then the father were to beckon him and say, come home, my son, and the soul that says, I will do as I please, started out that long journey back to God, if it were consummated in a moment or an eternity, it wouldn't make any difference. When that soul got close to God, if that soul were imperfect and human and selfish and all the things that God is not, the living flame of God would be to that soul a hellfire. And it would consume that individual on the instant. And that would be the fire that burns forever and ever and ever because it would have consumed the individual. Do you see what I mean? Now, God doesn't want that to happen. And so people do keep dying and being reborn and dying and being reborn in the hope of the Father that they will finally come home, finally return back to him as in the prodigal son's story. And his mercy does endure forever. For practical purposes, most people have over a million years in which they can expiate the soul. They can dissipate its energies, ignore its opportunities and mandates, and ultimately be destroyed in the second death, which is an act of mercy for the continual perpetuation of an individual where all of the lives are not connected at all, where there are only a series of vignettes, episodes, not even related to each other by the thread, the golden thread of divine intelligence and Christed realization. Why, what in the world are we then trying to perpetuate? Are we trying to perpetuate perpetual motion, which already has its own eternal power? Of course not. We're trying to perpetuate flesh and blood, which cannot ever inherit the kingdom of God. It cannot ever inherit the kingdom of God. It must be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, in the eye of God. We have to change our carnal nature. We have to put on Christ. We have to fulfill our divine destiny. Some people say, well, that doesn't sound to me like as if God gives us any free will. Well, first of all, who and what is God? God is being. And this being is benign. He's good. And goodness produces happiness. And so it is the will of God that man should be happy. Well, he could not be happy permanently in a rat race where he's fighting all the time with his neighbor where he's struggling for recognition, where he's fearful and afraid, where he is in ignorance, and the torpor of ignorance is all around him? Could he? Of course he couldn't. So, after millenniums and after vast amounts of struggle where the soul has not exerted any effort, out of the great mercy of God, instead of drawing the soul back to him and burning it alive, or consuming it or incinerating it, God simply says, you are now in a state where you have lost all of the initial impetus. And when your spring runs down at the close of this life, I'm not going to wind it again. Because I gave it one big wind when I created you. And you've just let it run down. You've neglected it. You haven't tuned in. You could have wound it yourself. You had the energy to wind your own spring. But you didn't wind it. No. And that's exactly what happens. It's a merciful act and one that need not come to any. And therefore, we are now witnessing a strange phenomena. We're witnessing a phenomena of where man is actually being led toward God all the time. But he doesn't know it. And some people ignore God, and they don't know that either, because they don't believe in him. 
Or they believe in themselves more than they do in God, and you just can't find life that way because God alone is life. God is life. Without God, no life. As a Chinese laundryman says, no tickety, no shirty. And if that's a homely and poor illustration, it's still the facts of life, and that's what I'm trying to say. Because I want you to understand that what these ministers are saying out here is not true. It's not true that if you don't go to their altar and kneel there, and if you don't get baptized the way they tell you to, and if you don't read the Bible the way they tell you to and belong to their church, that you're going to be lost. And it isn't even true that if you belong to the Summit Lighthouse or don't belong to it, you're going to be lost. You could belong to it and be lost, or you could not belong to it and be lost. It's not belonging. It's understanding the principles and putting them into practice that comes. It's practicing what God preaches. And he preaches to us that we can be like him. That's what he's telling us. You can be like me. And when will we be like you, Father? When you see me as I am. When you see me as I am, you will be like me. So we realize then that the key to Christ's realization is Christ's perception. We have to perceive Christ. And this is what is meant by discerning the Lord's body. Where he says in the Lord's Supper, he says, they come in to take the Lord's Supper and one's hungry and another's drunken and this and that and the other thing. And he says that they perish because they don't discern the Lord's body. We have to learn to discern the Lord's body, the body of eternal substance. We have to absorb the wisdom ray from the consciousness of God. We have to absorb the love ray from the consciousness of God. We have to absorb the power ray from the consciousness of God. Did Jesus have these powers? All power in heaven and earth is given unto me. That's God. Presently, I will pray my Father. Father, I thank thee that thou hast given me these souls, and that none of them are lost save the son of perdition, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Remember this. Great love, Father, I thank thee. And did he have wisdom? Need we ask? Of course he had wisdom. So we can be saturated with all the qualities he had and manifested. We can be saturated with it. And this is what St. Germain taught. This is what Marie Corelli was talking about when she said, the cultivation and nourishment of the spark of God identity. This is what our decrees are for, to strip the shard, the false, phony shard, off from ourselves. Because we are a bundle of nerves and energy, and all of this energy comes through all these embodiments, and each embodiment has had its scar, tissue, which is put upon the soul like the rings in trees. And life after life after life, we've built negative patterns. And these negative patterns will actually be confuted in the violet flame. Oh, well, people say I've been practicing the violet flame for three years and I don't notice too much difference. I've talked to people that practiced it three days and noticed a lot of difference. It's how you do it, and it depends on how deeply vulcanized you are to your negatives. If you identify too much with your negatives, it's a little more difficult and it takes more use of the violet flame. It may take years more if you're identified to your negatives because you're not letting go of them. The flame has to submit to some degree to the will. And so if you want to have more effective use of the violet flame, just get the thought that the will of God is what you want to do. And you want it more than you want your human will. And when you have that, you surrender to the flame, the singing flame, as they pointed out during the class. You surrender to the singing flame. And then the joy of the flame comes in. And you welcome God. You welcome Christ. You welcome healing. You're asking for it. You're, you're, you're in love with it. You're not unhappy. You know the man or woman that says, God wants to take away everything I've got from me. It's like saying everything I like is either fattening 
or something else. God doesn't take away anything except the things that we shouldn't have in the first place. And God gives everything that we should have in the first place, which he already gave to us in his divine image in the beginning, but which we have overlain with misqualified substance, which we now have to balance. And if you would only get these mysteries across to the American public and the people of the world, you wouldn't have a continual buildup of negatives. What has happened instead is that they're all struggling with their ego. They're all striving for recognition. They all talk about the day I got saved, the day I was born. Well, you know very well if they got saved one day, they'd still be saved. And if you talk to most of these people, they tell you how they slid back. They backslid. They went away from God. Or they got enmeshed in turmoil. We are a little wiser by his grace. We realize that until you get to the absolute, you're only going to have a relative state of perfection. But we also realize that the great magnet that God's love is is a magnificent magnet, and when you get close enough to it, its influences become stronger, inversely proportionate, I suppose, to the square of something, which I can't explain in the technical term, but in other words, the closer you get, the more it can, the faster it can accelerate your pull. I wouldn't know how to say that. Was it all right? I uh, relied only on the interpolations of my presence to try to convey this idea across because actually, when you get to that point, somewhere along the line, and you just, boom. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Boom. Right back, you see. And that's what happens when you get too close to the magnet. Most people see God from afar off. And they're standing there looking up, and they say, well, I guess you're up there somewhere, old boy. You've been around a long time but I don't seem to have much contact with you. I know you must exist, but would you please wave to me? Give me a sign. Give me some kind of a sign. What does he say? An adulterous and wicked generation shall have no sign, except the sign of the prophet Jonah. As Jonah was in the whale's belly three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. So when you understand that, that it is the universal cycle within the heart of the earth, and that you better take advantage of those three days and three nights, because you know not the day nor the hour when your own little flame may finally burn out. And therefore, the best and smartest thing any of us can do is to nourish the flame. And that is the reason why people should decree, why they should pray, why they should listen to spiritual music, why they should listen to dictations, why they should read the Bible, why they should be good to their neighbors, because every one of these things, everything we do that is virtuous and godlike, magnetizes more and more of that flame spirit. And everything we do that cuts down our credits is the debits of human emotions of fear and viciousness and judgment against each other and all kinds of other things. When we do these things, each time we do it, we are cutting down the credits that we have already made. Well, what happens to the guy who came in and never made any credits? He's cutting down on the substance something else, isn't he? And the first thing you know, he's run out of ammunition. He's run out of life force. And then his clock is stopped. And that's what he means when he says, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? Or be a caster. So no matter how many mysteries we may face in life, the mystery of the soul and the mystery of the wedding garment, all these tie in together. The mystery of being a flame spirit and gathering more of God all the time is the fulfillment of immortal destiny. And it's quite wonderful when you stop to realize it, that God has really made provision for people to be reunited. He's made provision for us to not only be reunited with himself, but with our loved ones. 
because they all can follow these fashions, the fashions of the kingdom of heaven. It's possible for them. Under the old system, somebody had a little girl or a little boy. If they died when they were one year old, well, they were gone. They never did come again. If a father was 90 and his son was 50 and the son died, the father didn't have any hope of seeing him again unless he went to heaven. And if he missed the boat for any reason at all, there just wasn't any connection. Well, what connection is there anyway that really amounts to anything? Who really cares about these human personalities? I don't think Jesus was much concerned because he said, Weep not for me, ye daughters of Jerusalem, but weep for yourselves and your children. He recognized that all this human weeping and tear shedding, I was going to say sheer tedding, I almost got it wrong, but all this tear shedding and everything was meaningless. He realized that the only thing that counted was the kingdom of the Father, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the whole I Spirit. What a great tragedy it is that the academic and theological world do not have these concepts. What a tremendous shortchanging it is. And therefore, the councils of Nicaea and Trent and all the councils and councils that were never convened and conniving of people down through the centuries to alter the scriptures, it has all taken its toll of man and his dogma. So today, the dark forces the re-embodied spirits of the Atlanteans that were dark, coming in in these motorcycle gangs and in these hippies, are now all over the world. They're now in Hyderabad in India. They tell me that the Khyber Passman, we learned that this morning from the newspaper, the Khyber Passman, are astounded at them. And there they are coming in with their all matted hair and their jeans, smoking hashish, where they can get it almost for nothing over there. They're all going along singing and smoking hashish and carrying banners, love and peace. It's all a fraud. It's a fake. Because there is violence, this afternoon we had a visitor here. I was told this morning we would have him. As he walked out the gate, he said to Guy Hudson, I am a communist. And while he was here, he told me that all hippies were lovers of peace and love. I said, not so, because they had been killing each other on the beaches in San Diego. And he said, that's the fault of the mafia. I said, what do you mean? He said, the mafia have gone into the drug traffic, and they're controlling the outlets of all these drugs to the hippies. Nevertheless, regardless of all these innuendos, you are witnessing in the manifestation of these people the re-embodiment of the decadent Atlanteans. I am not saying and I am not implying that everyone that's a hippie or ever was one is a decadent Atlantean. That's not true. I'm simply saying that the movement as such was started by them and that the energies of the lost Atlanteans is that which they are purveying into the world. And the drug addictions that they advocate are very difficult to rid oneself of. And happy are the individuals that can do so because then they can once again establish their norm of getting back into a pattern of seeking God so that they are not a castaway. But we must not close this service without recognizing just what is happening. This whole plan was created in the mind of Lucifer. And it was a plan whereby he would take over the world. And here is how he proposed to do it. He proposed, first of all, to bring in the red dragon in Russia and take over Russia and the minds of the Russian people through communism, which is not communalism. That is Christian communalism. But it's communism, something else, the commune but not communing with God, communing with one another, as they do in sensitivity training. But now what happens? First, the red dragon takes over Russia through Rasputin, Lenin, and Marx. 
Then what happens? They take over nation after nation after nation in the world. Now there's one great nation standing out above all the family of nations it holds out. It's the Christian nation America. It's the wilderness nation where the wings of an eagle were given to the woman. Look at that eagle. And to the woman were given the wings of a great eagle that she should fly into the wilderness. And that's where she flew to have the man-child here, to nourish the young child. And that is the living Christ. America was intended to be the shield and protector of the Christ. Although he was born in Bethlehem, this nation was intended to embody the Christ concepts. Therefore, it was intended to be a christ in nation, a nation polarized to the Christ. It has not fulfilled its destiny, because Lucifer said, I'll fix them. And so he took the teachings of Darwin, which teachings were not evil in themselves, but thinking made them so. The evolutions that Darwin pointed out were physical. And a lot of the things he said were true. But the interpretations they made on Darwin's theory is what's wrong. You understand? The interpretations. And so, when we hear about the Scopes trial down in Tennessee between Clarence Darrow and William Jennings Bryan, we saw the one representing Lucifer and the other representing God? No. They both represented Lucifer. William Jennings Bryan represented Lucifer as much as Clarence Darrow. And Clarence Darrow represented God as much as William Jennings Bryan because it was a sort of a horse of peace. That thing was just something that made ridicule and light of the kingdom of God. It laughed and mocked the kingdom of God, the whole thing from both sides. Because there was truth in Darwin's statements and his ideas. But what did Jennings Bryan do? He came out and used his oratory, his golden voice, to preach ridiculousness to mankind. And they made it so ridiculous that the intelligent people of the country, even the Christian people, begin to embrace the theory of evolution the wrong way. And that was put into the high schools and colleges and approved by law, and it finally reached a point where that doctrine, together with others, and communism was behind the movement to rob the youth of this land of a Christian education and bring them into godless atheism. Millions and millions and millions of American mothers and fathers sent their child to college to come home educated. And the child came home. And what did the child come home with? The child come home with a destroyed faith in God. And after they destroyed the faith of the youth in God, what did they have left? Nothing but materialism. If you don't have God, you have material, matter. All right, now how did it work? The first recruits to atheistic communism and to atheistic godlessness became teachers. And they went back into the universities. And they kept this up until, in our day, we have seen a time when there is scarcely a godly teacher left in the land. Now, I want to emphasize to you that I'm not as radical as I sound on that. I realize that there are some, but for practical purposes. I'm saying there are none, because, I mean, they have destroyed so many of them that there's not enough of them to make a tinkers in the whole country. And so the crop of youth that are now being turned out in our universities all over are being trained in godless atheism. Religion is a mockery, psychedelic drugs, and strobe lights, and all of this which came into being within the past 10 or 15 years is now the accepted thing, and they think in their narrowness of being, that that is all there is. They don't know about fun at the fair. They don't know about the gay 90s. It's only an era to them. They don't know about the happiness that people had in farms and homes, sitting around a fire popping corn. They don't know about the simple joys that existed before television, and before radio, and before the motor car became a cuddle box 
They don't know anything about these things. They live in an area where all of the realities of the past is sliced off from their consciousness. And they live in a world of their own making. And now they say, this which we have, and Lucifer planned it that way, is the only way. We demand a voice to be heard, they say. Down with the women and the children, me first. When you come to an elevator and you're getting out of the elevator, they practically knock you down trying to get in and won't let you out. They have no manners, they're uncouth. A group of men at one of our big universities, they happen to be Negroes, they could have been white. They threw the parents out of the dormitories that were there visiting their children just recently. And all over the land, violence and infamy and horror is on the march. It is the product of godless atheism. It is the product of these teachers who have taught no respect for God and country. I have come now to the point where they would have me believe that all is lost. I have come to the point where the dark forces will come to me and say, we've got the country. It's ours. We've got the youth. We'll get their younger brothers. We'll reduce the voting age. We'll take over this country socialistically because it's only a matter of time until we have enough of them that we have trained in positions of power, as Adolf Hitler said, and we will be able then to take over this country. And then we'll legislate and control and turn it over to the communists. And the communists will come in and they'll clean up the mess. And we'll have a real wonderful Marxist revolution and a Marxist evolution. And all will be well and the red flag, the hammer and sickle will be everywhere. And the workers of the world will arise. And the proletariat will march shoulder to shoulder with his brother and say, Start me with ten who are stout-hearted men, and the revolution will spread to the moon, and they'll colonize the universe and fill the universe with godless, socialistic individuals who will be born, who will eat like pigs, and the animal farm will be with us, and they'll die and be buried in a nameless grave with a number on record. The meaning of life lost and all of the divine intent collapsed and Lucifer fed forever by these pigs that he will milk of their energy. That's the plan. Keep the world safe for Satan, for the demons, by assuring that we have plenty of bodies and plenty of souls that we can continually drain. The red dragon. Can you think of anything worse than that? No, there's only one thing worse, and that's the downfall of the individual. So we are dedicated to the upraising of the individual and the upraising of society. And I want to tell you a very important point right now. It is true that we have millions and millions of young people that are now under 19. It is true that we have now millions of them that are 30 and under who are conditioned to these responses I have spoken of. But let us not forget that we are in an era of longevity. We are in an era where people are living to be 80 and 90 now and still be active, some of them, not all of them, for great senility is also with us. But we still have a better than fighting chance because we have people up to 70 and beyond and I think the median would be beyond 70 even, probably 75. And if we subtract 30 from 75, what do we get? Hmm? 45. So you see, we still have a chance. The old fogies, the fuddy-duds, the people who lived and saw this other side of life are still on earth. And if they will exercise their prerogatives of giving a blasted good spanking to these brats and showing them what the Heavenly Father really intended by waking up themselves and getting off of their own silly bandwagons of corruption before it's too late, there's still a chance that we could turn the whole thing upside down and save the world, yet. 
but that chance is slipping away every day and every hour. And I know it, and that's why I talk about it. Because it won't do any good for me to talk about it after the commissar in Denver is in power. He'll close us up so fast, he won't ask us, do you want a tax exemption? He'll say, would you like to go to Siberia? They're out here in the cemetery, the crematorium, where we'll finish you off. There'll be no freedom of religion in this nation once they take over. Because if they take over America, they will have the world. Remember that. Once they have America, they will have the world except China. And if they get China, you will see the pigs and the boars battling it out together to see which one wins. Personally, I think the boars of the Chinese would be probably worse to live under than the communists in Moscow because they have a strange oriental twist. And they're even more dedicated to Marx than the Russians, who still have a certain amount of fun-loving nature where they like to drink vodka and dance the polka. There might be a little more folksiness if we had to live in the Moscow way than it would be if we had to live in the Chinese way, where communism is a religion in China. So the world of the future is bleak indeed unless we can recognize where the trouble lies. Also, you've got to realize that the Christian churches and the Christian people of Colorado Springs wouldn't pay any attention to what I would say because the first compromises were made in religion. They made these compromises in religion that has caused men to feel they can sin and get away with it. And so their soul can be lost. But there is a way. And our decrees are needed every day. I'll put it to you this way. If you were in a boat and it sprung a leak, and it was a fairly good-sized boat, and each of you had a little can that would hold a gallon of water, and the water was pouring in at the rate of so many gallons a minute, and you knew that you'd have to keep on every single minute emptying a gallon of water over the side or the boat would go down. You'd keep bailing, wouldn't you? Well, that's exactly what we have to do now. We've got a fighting chance yet. It's cut to a pretty slim margin, I admit. But we just got to keep bailing. And while we're bailing now, we've got to also recognize that we must also nourish our own souls. We cannot become so involved in saving humanity, that we lose all of our spiritual energy, which is the only thing that's going to distinguish us from the masses in the long run. They had to have Judas Iscariot to pick Jesus out. He didn't have any halo, honey child. He didn't look so much different than the rest of the ignorant crowd that they could even tell who he was. 